A manufacturer produces tiles. On average, 10% of the tiles produced are faulty. Faulty tires occur randomly and independently. In the first part of the question, we're going to be finding probabilities to do with the number of faulty tiles in the sample. So, as usual, I'll be picturing some tiles and imagining that 10% of these tiles are faulty. So, looking through the question, I can see that later on it's going to become a hypothesis test question. This means it's quite likely to be a binomial distribution question and that's going to give us the key to answering the first section. So, looking at the first part of the question, a random sample of 18 tiles is selected and we need to find the probability that there are exactly two faulty tiles in the sample. So, as I mentioned, I'm expecting a binomial distribution because of the hypothesis test part of the question later, but it's a binomial distribution sort of situation. We've got a sample of n trials, in this case n is 18, and we have two possible outcomes. We could have that the tiles could be faulty or not faulty. So I'll make a note then, because it's the number of faulty tiles that we're interested in, that's the thing I'll call x. And x has a binomial distribution with the n value of 18 and the probability of being faulty, which is what we're interested in, is 0.1, as 10% is 0.1. I like to make a note to one side that my p-value is 0.1 and also my q-value which is 1 minus 0.1, so in this case q is 0.9. So I need to find the probability that there are exactly two faulty tiles in the sample. When the probability I'm looking for is something like an exact value like this, I can use the formula. This is not given in the formula book, so I need to make sure I've learnt this one. So the probability that x equals a particular value r is ncr p to the power of r, q to the power of n minus r. So I'm looking for the probability that x equals 2. So my ncr value is 18c2, my p to the r is 0.1 to the power of 2, and my q to the n minus r is 0.9, and then 18 minus 2 is 16, so that's my power. I can type that into the calculator, 18, shift, and then the button which says NCR above it, 2, and multiply by 0.1 squared, and multiply by 0.9 to the power of 16. I see that this gives me 0.283512, and so on. As a general rule, I will round probability answers to three significant figures. So I want the first three non-zero digits, so that's 283, and then I look at the next digit, which is a 5, that tells me I'm going to round up. So my final answer is going to be 0 0.284, and in brackets I'll just note that I've rounded to three significant figures. Moving on to part B, I now need to find the probability that there are more than two faulty tiles in the sample. So using my notation, that's the probability that x is greater than 2. When I have an inequality like this, it's usually quickest to use the tables. So I'll be looking up a value in the tables, but I like to be sure that I'm getting the right value. I like to make a note of a little number line. I put the value that we were given, in this case 2, in the middle, and write down to the left of it the number before it, in this case 1, and to the right the number after, in this case 3. So being more than 2, so that's not including 2, more than 2 means I'm going to break my number line up in between the 2 and the 3. I want these values 3 and above. So values that 3 are greater is the values that are more than 2. So if I do 1 minus everything up to and including 2, which is what's given in the tables, then I will be able to get the correct value. So I'm looking for 1 minus probability that x is less than or equal to 2. So I get my copy of the formula booklet and go through to the cumulative binomial probability tables and I find the page which has n is 18. And then I go to the probabilities and I look for the probability of 0.1. I go down and look for the column and I look for the value where x is 2. In this case, I'm using 0 0.7338. So that's 1 minus 0 0.7338. Now I'm not going to reach for my calculator this time. It's far quicker to do this in my head. The reason for that is when 
doing these, all we need to do is look at the digits and we make each digit add up to 9 apart from the final one which adds up to 10. You should be able to see why this works if you have a look. So in this case 0 0.7 I'd add 2 to make 9, 3 I'd add 6 to make 9 and again 6 to make 9 and then 8 add 2 would make 10. So my final answer is 0 0.2662. I don't usually write 4SF for this, I just write that it's come from tables by way of showing the rounding that's been used. And now on to the final part in section 1, on part C, we need to find the expected number of faulty tiles in the sample. So I've got a formula for that, again not in the formula book, the expected value is NP. So I had n was 18, p was 0 0.1, I multiply those together, I've got 1.8 tiles. That's the expected number of tiles in a sample of 18 that would be faulty. We now move on to the hypothesis testing part of the question. A cheaper way of producing the tiles is introduced. The manufacturer believes that this may increase the proportion of faulty tiles. In order to check this, a random sample of 18 tiles producing, produced using the cheaper process is selected and a hypothesis test is carried out. So first we're going to write down the hypotheses and explain something about the alternative hypothesis. Now before doing that, just a bit of a word of warning. In this question it's not so bad because the data is actually given in part 4 but sometimes this fact might be given earlier in the question and people try to use the result from the sample in their hypothesis. We see later on that there are four faulty tiles in the sample. This comes up in part four later on in the question. Some people would then say the probability is four out of 18 and they'd use that in their hypothesis. Now, that's not what the hypothesis test is all about. Once we've got the results, we know the probability of a tile in that sample being faulty it would be 4 out of 18. That's not what we're trying to find out. That's not the interesting thing. What we want to know is, if we looked at all of the tiles produced by this process, would the probability of a tile from the process still be 10% of it being faulty? So we're taking a sample and using the results in our sample, we want to see whether the amount that are faulty there gives us evidence that the amount in general in the population of all the tiles has increased. So when we're writing our hypothesis then, we always start with the null hypothesis written H with a subscript of zero and it's always P equals for the null hypothesis. That sign is an always an equals sign. And the probability is the 10% from earlier in the question. We're testing to see whether or not the probability of a tile being faulty is still 10% or if it has increased. So our alternative hypothesis is where we're looking at the fact that this number of faulty tiles may have been increased. So our alternative hypothesis, notated H with a subscript of 1, is that P is greater than 0.1. Now we haven't quite finished yet, we won't get the full marks for writing down the hypotheses unless we actually say what P is. So in this case, P is the probability of a tile being faulty. And not just that, we're talking about the tiles out of all of the tiles that are made being faulty. So it's the probability of a tile being faulty in the population. Now I've written down enough to get the marks. But actually, I might just quickly jot down what those hypotheses mean in words. Not because it will get me more marks, but because it will help me when I write the conclusion of my hypothesis test later. So, in words, P being equal to 0 0.1 would mean that the proportion of faulty tiles has stayed the same. P being greater than 0 0.1 would mean that the proportion of faulty tiles has increased. That will help me later on. So I'm now ready for part B. Write, uh, sorry, explain why the alternative hypothesis has the form that it does. So my alternative hypothesis was that P is greater than 0 0.1. Other forms of alternative hypothesis could have P less than 0 0.1 or P not equal to 0 0.1. So they're interested in why in this case it's the fact that P is greater than 0 0.1. So I'll write down that H1 has the form P is greater than 0 0.1. 
because it's believed that the proportion of faulty tiles may increase. This was the word given in the question. This also tells me it's a one-tail test. A comparative word like increase, got better, has improved, would be a one-tail test. Or similarly, something like decreased, has got worse, has deteriorated, is smaller, that would be a one-tail test the other way. Something like the probability has changed, or it is not the same, or it is different, it's not saying it's bigger or it's smaller, those sorts of situations would be the two-tail test. That would be when an alternative hypothesis would have a not equal to sign rather than an inequality sign greater than or less than in the alternative hypothesis. Find the critical region for the test at the 5% level showing all of your calculations. Now, I always find it helpful to draw a diagram at this stage. So my diagram is showing the distribution of the probabilities of different numbers of faulty tiles in the sample. It's a 5% level, so I shade in 5% on my diagram at the end. In this case, because we think the proportion has increased, we'll be looking at the larger end of numbers of tiles. So we're trying to find out how many tiles would need to be faulty to give us evidence that the proportion of faulty tiles has increased. So I was expecting uh, 1.8 faulty tiles. So 1.8 would be somewhere down here. That's completely as expected. So if I had a couple of faulty tiles, maybe even three, maybe four, I would think, okay, that's about what I expected. If I had sort of 20 faulty tiles or even maybe 15 faulty tiles, that's going to be way more than expected and perhaps give me evidence that there has been an increase in the proportion of faulty tiles. So the mathematical way of deciding exactly how many is going to be enough to give us the sufficient evidence is the numbers of tiles that would be faulty only 5% of the time if the probability is still 10%. So if the probability of tiles being faulty is still 10%, 5% of the time we will get an unexpectedly large number of tiles being faulty, but if we get a result that large, we think it's unlikely that we're in this 5% of the time, we're probably in the 95% of the time. So if we get a result that big, we'll think we've got sufficient evidence that the probability is not 10% and it has in fact increased. We won't be able to say that the probability has increased, we'll just be saying we have sufficient evidence that it has. So what we need to do is find out what values are here. And this is what the critical region is all about. So finding the critical region is finding the values of x that would be in this least likely 5% of the time. So I usually start in the middle with these. It's made harder by the fact that it is at the larger end. If it's at the small end, we just go to the binomial tables and look for the point when the probabilities go from being less than 5% to being more than 5%. But if we're looking at the tables, at the small end then, that would have been relatively straightforward. In fact, there aren't any less than 5%. We come straight in at 15%. But we'll be doing 1 minus. So I'm looking for 1 minus 95%. So numbers close to 95%, we've got 90% and 97%. So starting in the middle, I'll be doing 1 minus this value that's around 90% and using the method from before, making the digits add up to 9. So 9 add 0 is 9, 0 add 9, 1 add 8, and then finally 8 add 2 to make 10 on the end there. I'll write that as a percentage, I think, makes it slightly clearer. That's 9.8%, which is greater than 5%. The reason I'm using 5% here is that it was the 5% significance level used in this question. Usually we're told to use a certain significance level. If we weren't told, 5% is the standard that we usually use. Okay, so doing the same sort of thing for the value that's the other side of 95%, in this case about 97%, 1 minus that value, I'm getting 0 0.028, so that's about 2.8%, which is less than 5%. So that's the bit that's interesting. Now, looking on the tables then, and just working back from that to see the values that we've got, 
that 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 3. So I might be thinking that my values are going to be a 3 and then a 4 by using this 3 and 4. But I need to be a little bit careful here because using the same method as before, if I think about 1 minus less than or equal to 3, that's 1 minus everything less than or equal to 3, which means what I'm actually left with is 4 or more. Similarly, um, if I look at the 4, if I do a little number line with a 4 in the middle, 1 minus everything less than or equal to 4 leaves me with 5 or more. So in fact, the values that are going to go onto my diagram are 4 and 5 being at the boundary of this critical region. So the critical value is actually the value that's the least extreme value in the critical region. This 5 is the most interesting value. It's kind of the decision-making number of tiles. So 0 to 4 tiles, and we think, yep, fair enough, it's still about 10% of the tiles that are faulty. But if we have 5 or more tiles being faulty, that's going to give us sufficient evidence that the proportion of faulty tiles has increased. So, I have shown all the calculations there. What I haven't done yet is to actually state what the critical region is. So I just need to make that clear, so I'm going to write that down. So the critical region is all the values of x in between 5 and 20. Then part 4, this is where we make our final actual completion of the test. There are four faulty tiles in the sample, so complete the test stating your conclusions clearly. So I look at my diagram and look to see where 4 is. So 0 to 4, 4 is in this unshaded region. This is the dull, boring region where nothing exciting is going on, um, so we're not getting evidence. Being in the critical region is the interesting case where H1 might be happening, but being in the unshaded region, this is our accept H0 region. Okay, so the result X is 4 is not in the critical region. I'm going to accept H0. Now when I write my conclusion, what I then write is using the wording of H1. Remember I wrote that down earlier to, to help me write the conclusion? So I'm going to say that there is not sufficient evidence to suggest that the proportion of faulty tiles has increased. It's important that this conclusion uses wording from the question. So I don't just say, oh, H1 is not true, or anything like that. I actually use the words in the context of the question. The first bit, I do just say, accept or reject H0. But then it's all in terms of wording with the alternative hypothesis. OK, just looking at the mark scheme here then, it's pretty much everything that we did. So here's the distribution written down. That probability in the first part, this is an alternative notation meaning NCR. So 18.2 written between brackets above each other like that, that's just another way of writing NCR. Then using the tables, that's the same as was done before. Everything else seems fairly standard. Here, in the hypothesis, they have said about P being the probability that a randomly selected tile is faulty. Definition of P has to be in context. What they didn't include was the wording in the population. We have been told by the exam boards that they'll be looking out for that phrase in the, in the population within the hypothesis test. Then the increase was the key word that they were looking for about that alternative hypothesis. Here's all the working that we just did to find that critical region. Now, they've written out their critical region of a set of values. Um, it was absolutely fine for us to do it in the way that we did. Um, I've just realised I did 20. It should have said 18 there, of course, not 20. So I would have perhaps lost one mark there. It should have been 18, but not 20. Um, and finally, 4 does not lie in the critical region. And so going on to the conclusion in context, which is what we did.